Thank you for the opportunity to commemorate with all of you the 80th anniversary of the attacks on Pearl Harbor. For this 80th anniversary, I find it fitting to highlight one of the many brave sailors who died on that fateful day, who was recently returned to Wisconsin. His name was Machida's mate, first class, Harold Carney. Harold was born in October 26, 1918 in New Diggins, Wisconsin, about 120 miles from Naval Station Great Lakes. He was a son of John and Mary Ellen Carney and enlisted in the Navy on October 12, 1937, at the age of 19. He was only 23 on December 7, 1941, serving on board the USS Oklahoma, affectionately known as the Okie. The sailors serving aboard, like those serving all around the world today, were mostly young and far from home. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor that morning, USS Oklahoma was moored on berth Foxtrot 5 on Battleship Row, alongside the battleship USS Maryland. Oklahoma was immediately targeted by two planes and was struck with three torpedoes that morning. The first and second hit moments apart during the very beginning attack, striking a midship just below the waterline. Oklahoma was immediately targeted by two airplanes that fateful morning and was struck with three torpedoes in the opening moments. The first and second hit struck just below the waterline amidships between the smokestack and the main mast. The ship jumped out of the water and the whole thing shook, recalled a USS Oklahoma survivor, Petty Officer Second Class, Walter Staff. Although the first two torpedoes caused significant damage, neither penetrated the hull. During the attack, 80 men scrambled to the main uh, decks and the anti-aircraft guns on deck, but were unable to use them because the firing locks were in the armory. Most of the remaining crew manned their battle stations below the waterline or sought shelter on the third deck awaiting orders. During the chaos, the third torpedo struck close to where the two first torpedoes had hit but penetrated the hull, destroying the adjacent fuel bunkers and rupturing the two forward boiler rooms. As she began to list a port, two more torpedoes struck and many sailors were subject to subjected to aircraft strafing as they abandoned their sinking ship. In the first 10 minutes of the battle, the Oklahoma absorbed as many as nine hits. In less than 12 minutes, she rolled over and was halted by her masts touching the bottom of the harbor, her starboard side above the water and part of her keel exposed. Many of her crew, however, remained in the fight, climbing aboard the USS Maryland to man her anti-aircraft batteries. As the fight ended, 32 sailors from the USS Oklahoma were wounded and many more were trapped below the capsized hull. They found themselves in a strange world, turned upside down in complete darkness as compartments filled with water. Efforts to rescue them began within minutes of the ship's capsizing and continued into the night. This was a delicate process as torching opened the holes, released trapped air, raising the water levels below the deck, while cutting in the wrong place would have ignited the stored fuel. Banging on the hull could be heard for three days, and then there was silence. Some survivors were never reached in time. By the end of the attack, 429 brave sailors of the U.S. Oklahoma were listed as killed or missing, including machinist mate first class Harold Carney, who was posthumously awarded the Purple Heart. The sinking of the Oklahoma resulted in the second greatest loss of life on Pearl Harbor. The remains of the once mighty Oklahoma were ultimately sold for scrap years later. But while being towed to San Francisco, a sudden storm caused her to sink to the bottom of the Pacific over 500 miles away from Hawaii. Only 35 of the 429 sailors who died on Oklahoma were identified in the years to follow. The remains of 394 unidentified were buried as unknowns in Hawaiian cemeteries, but were all disinterned in 1947 in an effort to identify them. By 1950, those who could not be identified from Oklahoma were laid to rest at the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific. Almost 65 years later, with renewed commitment and assistance from advances in DNA technology, the Department of Defense announced in 2015 that the unidentified remains of the remaining crew members of Oklahoma would be exhumed for DNA analysis with the goal of returning all uh, remains to their families. The process began in June 2015 when four graves were disinterred for DNA analysis by the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency. By December 2017, the, identify, the identity of over 100 crew members had been discovered, and by 
February 2019, that number had risen to 200. Throughout 2019 and 2020, the efforts continued to successfully identify more crew members, and in February of this year, they announced they had identified their 300th member. This June, the program announced that their efforts had come to a close, with the remains of 51 crew members who could not be identified. They will be returned to Hawaii and buried once again at the National Museum for the Pacific at Punchbowl Crater. That ceremony is scheduled for today, the 80th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. In total, the program has identified 343 crew members from the USS Oklahoma, including two Medal of Honor recipients, giving the program a success rate of over 88%, which brings us to November 6, 2021, just a month ago. A military graveside service was held that day at St. Patrick's Church Cemetery in Benton, Wisconsin for machinist mate first class Harold Carney. Harold's remains were identified through extensive DNA analysis by the dedicated efforts of the POW Accounting Office. Harold's family has never given up and neither did the United States Navy. Harold was survived by nieces and nephews from California, Massachusetts, Iowa, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Florida, and many of them were there to see Harold laid to rest. I'm proud to say that sailors from Naval Station Great Lakes were there to perform grade, graveside honors. Led by sailors from Navy Operations Support Center Chicago in support of the Naval Station Great Lakes Rifle Team and Navy Band Great Lakes. Between the attacks of Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941 and the surrender of Japan on August 14, 1945, over 16 million Americans served on active duty and over 4 million served in the United States Navy. Of those, over 1 million began their training right here at Naval Station Great Lakes. Today, all of us in, at Naval Station Great Lakes are, be, are proud to be linked to that heritage and those brave members that served on December 7, 1941, and honored to be part of the current contribution to the Naval Force as the Navy's only boot camp for a session training. It is fitting that the reception barracks here at Naval Station Great Lakes for recruits arriving into the Navy is named the USS Pearl Harbor. Our Navy has never forgotten Pearl Harbor and the significance it has played in our history. Every day we work to continue that legacy of honor, courage, and commitment so strongly demonstrated at Pearl Harbor. It is a responsibility that all of us at Great Lakes take incredibly serious and one that is renewed each year as we commemorate the bravery and sacrifices at Pearl Harbor by shipmates like machinist mate, first class, Harold Carney. Thank you. The attack on Pearl Harbor is one of the most devastating events in American history. For the Navy, Pearl Harbor remains its greatest defeat and most shocking failure of naval intelligence. In a short 75 minutes, the Japanese attack crippled the United States fleet, killed 2,700 sailors, and catapulted the United States into the Second World War. In 1939, while the war progressed in Europe, ongoing tensions in East Asia reached an all-time high. Japan was in the midst of the Second Sino-Japanese War against China in an effort to establish themselves as the leading East Asian powerhouse. Japan's actions in the Second Sino-Japanese War were vocally condemned by the United States, British, and Soviet Union governments. In September 1940, Japan signed the Tripartite Pact, joining Japan with Italy and Germany as the three Axis powers. At this time, the United States strove to remain outside the war itself, but decided to place restricting embargoes of several sought-after materials like brass, copper, and iron in an attempt to restrict Japan's advancements throughout Asia. These restrictions became stricter over time and led to drastic deterioration of Japanese living conditions. The tough-love approach from the United States was not well received in Japan. Sensing a rising desperation within the Japanese people, Joseph Grew, the United States ambassador to Japan, wrote to President Roosevelt warning him that issues with Japan would at some point, quote, come to a head-on clash. Both governments began preparing for potential war. 
Japanese Admiral Yamamoto planned for a surprise attack against the U.S. Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor. The plan, later known as Hawaii Operation, utilized all six of Japan's first-line aircraft carriers along with 420 airplanes, making it the most powerful carrier force ever assembled. Meanwhile, Oahu had just become the new home of the U.S. Pacific Fleet in May 1940. The Navy was slowly building its strength, but it was a slow growth without much cause for rush or concern. Hawaii seemed an ideal home for the Pacific Fleet. Protection was provided by the natural elements of coral reefs and two mountain ranges. The U.S. military had thousands of troops stationed on the island, including the Pearl Harbor Naval Base and the Army Airfield. Most significantly, though, the distance from Japan to Pearl Harbor made it unlikely that Japan would attack the chain of islands. Despite the benefits of a military base on Oahu, it had drawbacks as well. Pearl Harbor was entirely dependent on the mainland for oil and other vital supplies, and most significantly, the distance between Hawaii and the mainland resulted in a severe lack of communication between the two. Unfortunately, not all of the intercepted messages were relayed from the intelligence offices on the mainland to the commanders at Pearl Harbor. It was an error that would later prove fatal. Military leaders were also lulled into a false sense of security over Pearl Harbor's seemingly impenetrable location. As early as 1931, the military recognized that an attack on Pearl Harbor was possible, but when Ambassador Gru relayed rumblings of a planned attack on Pearl Harbor, his superiors at the State Department dismissed it as nothing more than a rumor. It was believed the distance across the Pacific would be too far to travel, let alone attack. To many, Pearl Harbor seemed to be virtually impenetrable. General George C. Marshall, Army Chief of Staff, described Oahu as the strongest fortress in the world. This false sense of security would prove detrimental in December 1941. Meanwhile, Americans were watching the war unfold abroad, and they began to prepare for the possibility of joining that war. Men flocked to join the military in 1940. That year, the Navy saw a 77% increase in personnel. Amongst the Navy's newest sailors were three men, Robert Smith, Clarence Miller, and John Birdsaw. You know, that never came up, but it was, you know, I'm sure his buddies were, his buddy Fritz Mugley joined the Navy, and I think they knew people that were already in the Navy, so that kind of mm -hmm. steered them in that direction. I think so, yeah. So that they could see the world world in the, you know, so they wound up at Pearl Harbor. They came here for basic training at Great Lakes. He was assigned the USS Ramsey. So again, their first call of duty was out to uh, Pearl Harbor. So he was, uh, the Ramsey was a converted mine layer. So a four stack destroyer, so kind of a smaller ship. My understanding is that um, he enlisted, he had, his choice was enlisting in the Navy or going to college. And for some reason that I don't know, he actually chose to enlist in the Navy. My father's family included my father and his three brothers. Now the order of age goes Charles, John, Don, Howard, the four brothers I'm talking about. Charles and Don, Charles and John, my father, the two oldest, joined the military before the war broke out, before 1941. And that's why they were on Hickam and uh, Wheeler Field during the Pearl Harbor attack because they were in the military, they were sent to Hawaii. In the case of my father, at his enlistment, he and a friend flipped a coin to see who would get Philippines and who would get Hawaii. Those were the two choices they were offered. My dad won the Hawaii flip, whatever that was, heads or tails, and went to Hawaii. The other gentleman went to the Philippines and was killed early in the war. So it was a very lucky flip of a coin. Uh, that's one of the sort of anecdotal things. They both joined in 39. So in 41, they're both in for two years. Charles may have been 23 or 24, and my dad, John, I believe was 22. Many of those stationed at Pearl Harbor likely felt the same way John Birdsall did, 
that they had hit the jackpot of the beautiful duty station in Hawaii. Sadly, Birdsall and his fellow service members would soon come face to face with war. The fateful surprise began early on December 7, 1941. It was a Sunday and U.S. Naval forces were unprepared for what was to come. Just 11 days earlier, the Japanese fleet departed for Hawaii. They waited undiscovered less than 300 miles north of Pearl Harbor. Meanwhile, Sunday, December 7th, started off as any other Sunday morning. Sailors were attending church services, completing morning duties, or even returning from Liberty from the night before. Yeah, he was on board the Ramsey, so he just uh, got done with breakfast around six o'clock, and then he was up uh, polishing the rails. That was his duty that morning, mm -hmm. Sunday morning. So it was around, you know, from seven o'clock to seven thirty. He was doing that, and then uh, getting closer to when the attack started. You know, he started. He heard some explosions, and you know, like all these guys, they're like, "Hey, what are what are you doing practicing on Sunday?" And then, uh, sure, pretty he kind of reaction. Up, and he, saw, yeah, he saw the planes, and he saw the Japanese symbol on the plane, the red circle. So he's like, "Oh, this isn't right." And then uh, he went to his general quarters. He had orders to go back to the back of the ship where all this, everything was locked up because it was Sunday morning. So that didn't have a lot of anti-aircraft guns on the on the ship, but he went there unlocked and he brought out a bolt action Springfield rifle. So they brought those back up and you know they were shooting at these planes with these Springfield rifles. That was yeah. okay. he said the planes were low enough they could see the pilots so yeah. you know, they were trying to shoot with them. So he was across whatever the, they could get a hold of. Yeah. He was across the middle lock so that was across from Fort Island and Battleship Row so the main planes went and attacked Battleship Row and that flew out over his ship. And that's where he said he could see the uh, rear gunners' faces <laughs> and stuff like that. And every every one of these guys had a safe story. Yeah. <laughs> Charlie uh, was on his way to KP when the attackers. He would have been headed to get himself, uh, you know, get breakfast ready for the men on his base. He had KP duty. Uh, remember that at this time, these guys are just two years in the service, so they would have been privates. Uh, or, you know, maybe corporals, and that's, uh, I'm not clear on Army Air Corps ranking at the time, but they would have been somewhere in those ranks. Today we might say E1s, E2s, E3s, somewhere, because they had only been in for two years. Mm -hmm. At 0749, Commander Mitsuo Fukuda gave the signal for Japanese aviators to begin the attack on Pearl Harbor. Within the first minutes of the attack, Keahone Bay Naval Air Station, Wheeler Field, and Ave Marine Corps Air Station were hit by Japanese fighter and bomber planes, destroying countless military aircraft. At 07.53, nine Japanese dive bombers and torpedo planes swarmed Ford Island Naval Air Station and target ships moored on the west side of the island. USS Utah was struck with two torpedoes, capsizing her and killing 58 sailors, while another torpedo struck USS Raleigh, causing her to flood and lose power. Robert Birdsall's uncle, Bob Smith, was aboard USS Utah. The ship that he was on, and at the time that uh, the attack occurred, he was seaman first class, and um, further, based on uh, letters that I've seen that my mother's parents received after uh, the attack, um, his, my uncle's place on the ship was below the waterline, and at the time of the attack, um, there were um, uh, at least two torpedoes that hit, hit the ship, and um, one letter um, uh, stated that, that he was killed instantly because of where he was positioned on the ship and the torpedo that ultimately sank the ship. Japanese fighter pilots are able to strike USS Ogallala and USS Helena, but Ogallala is the only one to capsize. USS Detroit and USS Tangier are the only two ships to escape the attack. Battleship Row, located on the east side of Ford Island, also falls under attack. 24 torpedo bombers and 49 high-level bombers hone in on this section of the island. USS Arizona, USS West Virginia, and USS Oklahoma all suffered devastating hits and ultimately capsized, 
killing over 1,500 sailors. The USS Tennessee, USS Vestal, USS Nevada, and USS California are also hit and suffer damages. Meanwhile, at Hickam Field, Japanese bombers targeted the Army's airfield flight line, hangars, and bombers in an effort to prevent any counterattack from the Americans. Between 0840 and 0945, nearly half of the airplanes at Hickam Field had been destroyed or severely damaged. Suddenly, everything kind of changed, uh, and this, this attack happens, and surprise, uh, you know, a genuine surprise attack. They were not prepared for it, and so we lost a lot of ships and a lot of airplanes and a lot of guys um, because of that. It was a surprise attack. The first leg of the attack on Pearl Harbor took under five minutes. Hundreds of American service people lay dying. Ships and aircraft burned. Sailors scrambled to battle stations and to assist their wounded shipmates. Around the same time, a hurried message was dispatched from the Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet to all ships in the area, reading, Air Raid on Pearl Harbor. This is no drill. This message is the first indication of the raid to people outside of Hawaii. The break between the first and second wave of attacks lasted just 20 minutes. At 0854, a second wave of Japanese dive bombers, fighters, and bombers attack. Pilots target the USS Pennsylvania and USS Nevada, as well as the Navy Yard dry dock, where ships were assumed to be receiving maintenance. Three destroyers were ruined. Middle Lock, just across from Ford Island and Battleship Row, was another main area that saw much activity during the attack. The USS Gamble, USS Montgomery, USS Breeze, and USS Ramsey were all moored in this area. Bob and Rick Miller's father was aboard the USS Ramsey. If he was shocked, you know, initial shock, and then he always said, yeah, the training kicked in right away, and they had orders to get out of the harbor. They were one of the smaller ships. So they were out of the harbor within the first 40 minutes, and then they were you know, going on sub patrol. So when he went out, you know, like everything's attacks going on, you know, black smoke, fires, explosions, planes. So they're going down the channel. And I think they got credit for shooting down a plane. If we look in their in the ship log, uh, they report that he didn't remember that, but you know, he's probably not thinking what's going on. But when you look back, and kind of he kind of do low. Uh, see what the history of the ship is and stuff like that. So they got out of the harbor and he, he told us that he thought he was going to see the whole Japanese fleet out there. They didn't know, you know, think an invasion yeah. and everything. So. And they all wanted to sleep up on top, up on deck. They didn't want to be below <laughs> in case they got torpedoed. Yeah, so they said the people would bring them sandwiches and stuff. They, you know, they were up pretty much 24-7. Mm -hmm. And then, so they went on patrol back and forth, you know, for that whole week. In the span of roughly two hours of destruction, the surprise attack on U.S. bases on Oahu and Pearl Harbor brought forth staggering casualties. Casualties includes all those who were killed, missing, or wounded. The casualty numbers included 2,718 Navy, 1,078 Marines, 582 Army, and 103 civilians. It crippled the U.S. Pacific Fleet with 23 sunk or damaged ships. Meanwhile, the Japanese force lost only 100 men and 29 airplanes. In the aftermath, Americans asked how this event could have occurred. How did the Navy not know the attack was coming? Sadly, they did know, but it was too late. The process used to intercept messages and decode them was long, tedious, and sometimes inconsistent. When the message came through about an attack in the Pacific, there was confusion as to which island the Japanese were referring to. For these reasons, the message warning of the attack came too late. The bicycle messenger carrying the news was halfway to his destination when the first shots were fired. Evening newspapers across the country quickly spread the story of the unexpected and deadly attack on Pearl Harbor. The next day, President Roosevelt asked Congress to declare war on Japan and delivered his famous Day of Infamy speech. The attacks on Pearl Harbor brought attention to the intelligence and readiness failures of the United States military. 
Then Secretary of Labor Francis Perkins was quoted as saying, we have all been trained to think of the United States as invincible. And now we are faced with the fact that our Navy had cracked. The Navy was adamant that they would not face the same defeat again. New and updated lines of communications were established and code breakers were enlisted to help crack the Japanese intelligence. The code breakers would later become an integral component of the Navy's success at the Battle of Midway. The devastating events at Pearl Harbor brought forth a sense of unity among the American people as they rallied together to remember Pearl Harbor. For the families of the men and women who were there, the legacy of Pearl Harbor reverberates to this day. Well, I, you know, my, my understanding is, is speaking to my mom, naturally everyone was devastated. And they weren't just, I don't think it was just a devastation because he died. Um, it was clearly devastation too because they were attacked. And it was, um, from their perspective, um, an unprovoked attack. And, um, you know, it was done on a Sunday morning. It was done about 8 o'clock in the morning, I believe. And, and, you know, when many people, the sailors would be in church uh, or even returning from Liberty the night before. And, um, um, I don't know, that, that was, I think, uh, added to the difficulty and the, and the challenge of it. And the fact, too, that, that it was so far away. It was, again, going from New York City, basically, all the way to, um, Hawaii is a, is a great distance to think that you had a loved one that, that perished. Um, that alone, and then perished by conflict, um, is hard. And um, I, I think from what I remember hearing my mom say as an adult, me being the adult at the time, um, or of an age where I was an adult, um, you know, there was great animosity towards the Japanese. Um, and I think that even in later years for my mom, I, I'm not sure if she ever quite forgave them for what they did and taking her youngest brother. Um, one of the things that, that I possess that she gave me, um, and I have to show you today, is um, her parents from the Navy received a gold star. And the um, gold star is, is a, literally a small star pin. And I, I have that that I wear now on December 7th in, in honor of my uncle. And, and actually in honor of my mom and her family, too. Today, there are fewer than 20 Pearl Harbor survivors still alive in the United States. Descendants like Bob and Rick Miller, Scott McNeil, and Robert Birdsall are now our only link to those who are there. For these descendants, they feel a duty to keep the memory and stories of their fathers and uncles alive. Yeah, to keep that going. But I think we're, yeah, like you said, we're able to put more of a personal touch to it than somebody, I'm sure someone who's, who had a, a relative at Gettysburg or, or any other you know, major event like that would, would feel the same way. It's, it's not just a, a name in a book, it's not a story in a movie, it's, not, it's, it's actually real for you. Yeah. The attack on Pearl Harbor has a lasting impact on all Americans. It reminds us that the unexpected is always possible but it also illustrates the immense bravery of American service members and Americans' ability to come together amidst tragedy.